my chapter, my chapter. My chapter, my chapter. My chapter four, my chapter four.
Okay, good. Good morning. I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm calling to order this joint hearing with the Committee on Government Operations and the Committee on Economic Development. Today is June 5th and it is 10.31 p.m. and we're located in room 500 of the John A. Wilson Building. Uh, the purpose of this hearing, uh, and I will begin uh, and describe uh, the, the measures before us for efficiency's sake, and I will uh, then turn to my uh, co-convener of this hearing, uh, Ward 5 Council Member Kenya McDuffie, who chairs the Committee on Government Operations. Uh, PR-20-742 PR and 20-743, um, the 1005 North Capitol Street Northeast Surplus Declaration and Discipline uh, and disposition approval resolutions of 2014 are the subject of our hearing. PR, uh, these resolutions involve the Young School, um, and the Young School uh, is located at 1005 North Capitol Street. It was introduced by Chairman Mendelson at the request of the Mayor um, and referred to our committees. This resolution would approve the disposition of this real property located in Ward 6 six to a private developer, the North Capital Commons LP, um, and the disposition would be affected through a 99-year ground lease. North Capital Commons plans to develop this currently vacant 9,000 square foot lot into 80,000 square feet of um, residential units with 3,000 square feet of commercial space allotted. The 124-unit residential building is proposed to solely serve veterans and low income residents uh, with 60 units of permanent supportive housing for homeless veterans, 47 units of affordable housing for persons making less than 60 percent of the area median income, and 17 units for persons making less than 30 percent of the area median income, referred by the Department of Behavioral Health. The building will have a, a, a number of social services, including case management, psychiatric treatment, health counseling, substance abuse counseling, independent living workshops, and educational vocational trainings. Tenant amenities will include a computer room, meeting rooms, uh, elevated courtyard, social service provider offices, and 24-hour uh, security. The developer is responsible for funding this project and has secured um, bike financing um, from housing development agencies, the federal government, and private foundations. So with that, I want to um, turn to Council Member Kenya McDuffie um, for uh, any statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Bowser. Um, before I begin a brief statement, I just want to recognize the presence of Sixth graders from uh, Cesar Chavez School over in Ward 7 are joined here um, by their teacher, Ms. Ferrer. And I wanted to let you all know that we really appreciate you all being here. I understand that it's uh, City Council Day uh, for you all. I'm hoping to have an opportunity to chat with you all before you leave today. I think you have about 30 minutes where you all want to chat with uh, some council members uh, around the bills. And so I wanted to just thank you for coming here. And hopefully you have a great day and learn a whole lot and perhaps you can share with, with us uh, something that we can learn about what you all are doing. So thank you for being here this morning. Uh, and again, good morning. I want to thank Councilmember Valzer for convening this along with me. I'm Kenny McDuffie, Councilmember for Ward 5 and Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Uh, pursuant to District Code 10-801, when the executive wants to lease or sell a piece of district property, it must submit separate resolutions to the council for approval. One to declare that the piece of property is surplus property, and the other words, no longer needed for a government purpose and the second for approval of the disposition of the property. The Committee on Government Operations counts the Department of General Services as one of the agencies under its purview, and given that DGS manages the district's real estate portfolio, the surplus resolutions have been referred to my committee. I'll say just a few words briefly on each project, um, given that Councilmember Bowser has talked a little bit about them. The proposed resolution 20-6763 would declare the Charles Young School a surplus property. The Young School is actually located in Ward 5 adjacent to Spain, Lawn, Phelps, and Brown. 
schools. The Young School was closed uh, since 2008, and there have been several requests for offers that have been issued for its reuse. I was pleased to see that Two Rivers Public Charter School was awarded the Young School, especially given that uh, it is a Tier 1 school and is already about a quarter of its student body award for our residents. Proposed Resolution 20-742 the uh, 1005 North Capitol Street Northeast Surplus Declaration Approval Resolution would declare the vacant lot at North Capitol Street as surplus property. The property is a long vacant lot which sits adjacent to St. Philip's Baptist Church. This parcel of land sits in Ward 6 and my staff has spoken with Councilmember Wells' and staff regarding this project and they are supportive of it. I'm particularly pleased that this development project will be focused on permanent supportive housing and veteran housing. Additionally, the project our uh, team includes Mr. Todd, who I know was involved in the summit development, uh, which is a great asset in Ward 5 in the Eckington community. Uh, thank you again, uh, Madam Chair. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Well, thank you. Um, and I, too, want to welcome our students. And thank you for coming down to study what happens in your government. It's really important that, that you learn what happens down here because, you, you know, you're going to be in charge of it one day real soon. Uh, so thank you for studying and study hard. I know your school focuses on public policy, right? Um, and so this is very uh, a very important aspect, your local government. Uh, and I look forward to hearing back from you what, what you thought about it all. Uh, so enjoy your visit to uh, the city council. Uh, so the committee. Um, if it's okay with you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, we will uh, start and with a, a, the list of public witnesses who are signed up. If there's anybody here who would like to testify who's not signed up, just um, let our clerk know. And then we'll hear from the government. Um, the government is going to be represented on, in the case of the uh, 1005 North Capitol Street surplus uh, disposition by Corey Lee, who is a DEMPED project manager. And in the case of the young Young school surplus, um, the government will be represented by Brian Hanlon, who is the director of DGS. Um, so we'll first um, start with the witnesses for 1005 North Capitol Street Northeast. So, um, Kurt Rungi, I got it right this time, right? Close. Rungi, okay, I'm getting there. Uh, Chapman Todd, Nadine Mala. I don't see Monica. And Monica Warren Jones may uh, come up when she arrives. And Norma Kendall. Sorry. Did I call? Oh, Monica, you're there. I didn't see you in the room. Okay. So, um, Ms. Kendall, can I ask you to wait until this? Or may we could pull up a chair if you don't mind. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Rungi, why don't we start with you? Chairperson Bowser and McDuffie and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kurt Rungi, and I'm the Advocacy Director at Miriam's Kitchen and a Ward 5 resident. Miriam's Kitchen's mis mission is to end chronic homelessness in the district. We provide healthy meals and social services to people who are homeless, the majority of whom are chronically homeless, meaning that they've been homeless for years and have a serious illness. We also work with DC government agencies and nonprofits to, to prom promote and implement best practices to improve our homeless services system, and we are proud supporters of the Way Home Campaign to end chronic homelessness in the district by 2017. Miriam's Kitchen strongly supports Resolution 20-742 and 20-743 regarding the disposition of public land for the North Capital Commons Housing Project. The North Capital Commons Housing Project is a perfect example of using public land to address the district's lack of affordable housing and in chronic homelessness. The building will have 124 efficiency apartments, 64 will be targeted to individuals making no more than 60% of the area median income, and the remaining 60 will be permanent supportive housing using the Housing First model targeted at chronic homeless, chronically homeless veterans. With local and federal investments in permanent supportive housing and projects like this one, the district is on track to end veteran homelessness by 2015. 
A plan to end chronic veteran homelessness in the district developed by the local government and nonprofit providers is attached. We hope future legislation to create affordable housing on public land designate that some percentage of housing be permanent supportive housing and affordable to people living significantly below 30% of the area median income like this project accomplishes. On a given night in the district, there are 1,785 individuals and 133 families who are chronically homeless, meaning they've been homeless multiple times or years and have a serious illness. Over the course of the year, an estimated 500 veterans are chronically homeless. Ending chronic homelessness is urgent. People who are chronically homeless are four to nine times more likely to die young than the, than the general population. The average age of someone who is chronically homeless is in the 50s with an average life expectancy of 62. Many people who are chronically homeless are seniors. DHS reports that 1,475 seniors over the age of 60 used the shelter in 2013. Chronic homelessness is a public health crisis and the solution is clear permanent supportive housing. Permanent supportive housing is not housing for everyone who is homeless, but for the small percentage of individuals or families who are the most vulnerable and have been homeless for years and need intensive long-term support. The research is abundantly clear that PSH works and costs the same or much less than letting people remain chronically homeless. At Miriam's Kitchen, we see our guests cycle in and out of the ER or psychiatric hospital only to be discharged to the street. Our guests are concerned about survival, not thinking about seeing the dentist regularly or treating chronic health conditions. As a result, wounds fester and conditions grow more severe. The New England Journal of Medicine reports that for many patients, a prescription for housing or food is the most powerful one that a physician could write with health effects far exceeding those of most medications. DC can end chronic homelessness so that no one is homeless for years. However, at the current rate, DC won't end chronic homelessness until 2034. We support the disposition of public land for this project and urge the council to consider creative ways to increase the supply of permanent supportive housing in DC on public land and through other means. Creating permanent supportive housing is one step towards ending chronic homelessness. We also have to triage and prioritize the most vulnerable people in our community to ensure that the people who need PSH the most get it. The district recently launched a coordinated entry system to better match people to the housing and services needed to end one's homelessness. All future PSH, such as this project, should pull from that system. With the final vote of the budget approaching, we also urge the council to invest $3.1 million in the DHS Permanent Supportive Housing Program for 100 individuals and 20 families who are chronically homeless. The current budget pr proposal does a lot uh, to address homelessness, but it doesn't contain any, any new funding for chronically homeless individuals who are not veterans. And given the human and financial costs, it's an investment we can't afford to ignore. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Rangi. Uh, uh, board member Monica Warren Jones. Good, good morning, Chairman Bowser and Chairman McDuffie and members of the committee. My name is Monica Warren Jones, and I'd like to thank the council for this opportunity to provide testimony during this hearing. I'm testifying, to, testifying today in my capacity as Director of Relationship Management for the Washington, D.C. Office of Enterprise Community Partners a national financial intermediary that provides financing and expertise for the creation and preservation of homes and facilities to benefit low and moderate income people. In my role at Enterprise, I support our nonprofit and for-profit partners by providing strategic solutions using Enterprise products and services, including new markets tax credits, low-income housing tax credits, loans for the development and preservation of sustainable housing and community facilities. I'm also a Ward 6 um, resident, and I'm an elected member of the D.C. State Board of Education, although today I am speaking on behalf of my support for the North Capital Commons Project. For nearly 30 years, enterprises introduced neighborhood solutions through public-private partnerships with financial institutions, government, community organizations, and others that share our vision. And in Washington, D.C., my colleagues and I have worked with uh, to facilitate affordable housing and community development deals in collaboration with government, lenders, for-profit, <laughs> and nonprofit developers. We provide technical assistance to housing agencies, including the D.C. Uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, as well as developers alike. And for the past 12 years, our office has provided more than $500 million in capital to support affordable housing options in the D.C. area 
and which have resulted in the creation or preservation of more than 6,000 units. And I come today to offer just a few points of consideration as you consider the resolutions 2742 and 743, which if approved will enable the district-owned parcel at 1005 North Capitol to be leased and developed for the creation of 124 efficiency apartment units. Of the units, 64 will be targeted to individual households that make no, no more than 60% of the area median income, which as of 2013 was about $45,000. The remaining of the units will serve as permanent housing targeted to formerly homeless veterans. For the last four years, Enterprise has been monitoring this project, first by providing support to the project's original faith-based sponsor, and then later by offering operating support to its programmatic <coughs> partner, Common Ground. More recently, our mortgage arm affiliate, Bellwether, was selected to provide the project's permanent debt. And it's my understanding that you know, all of the capital has been assembled and this project is slated to close sometime in July. As I am sure you and members of the committee are aware, there is pent up and growing demand for affordable housing for low and moderate income households in the district. And according to the George Mason study on housing the region's workforce, half of the new renters coming here will need units that are priced at less than $1,250, which is equivalent to about a 50K annual salary. And while this project is intended to support a particular niche of the market, this data from George Mason clearly is clearly illustrative of the high need for housing units for households that are less than six that are at less than 60% uh, um, AMI. This project represents an excellent opportunity for the public sector to do its part to increase the supply of desperately needed units. The North Capital Project resonates with Enterprise's mission on multiple levels. It provides a rare opportunity for more than 100 units to be built within blocks of the Capitol, near transit, and other amenities for our most vulnerable residents, including singles on the verge of homelessness and veterans who have risked their lives to serve our country. What is now a vacant site will soon be improved to provide homes for those who truly deserve quality features like a space for their bikes, community room, community computer and workout room, and important site-based supportive services. These types of amenities are usually only provided in the most upmarket of housing options. For supportive housing, it is extremely challenging to assemble the multiple pieces of capital, including the tax credits, the equity, the government and nonprofit and private sector lending sources that are necessary to make these investments possible. Enterprise is extremely proud to work with a development team headed by McCormick Baron Salazar, who shares our commitment for high quality, holistic community developments that enable low income peoples to live and thrive. And we've actually have a fairly a very good reputation at working with this group. Um, we've done at least four previous mixed income deals, all of stellar quality. Um, but for their investment to date, I don't think this project would have been possible. I urge the committee to approve the land disposition it is a, as it is a very important step in getting this well-deserved project underway for the many individuals who desire and deserve a quality home in the District of Columbia. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, board member. And I'm afraid I don't know your name. Um, yes, if you could just introduce yourself and then uh, you may begin. Okay. My name is Norma Canedo. Thank you, ma'am, for being here. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. Um, like I said, my name is Norma Cindy Canedo. I have been a parishioner of St. Matthew's Cathedral for over 20 years, and am now on staff working with our social justice ministries. I am also a leader with the Washington Interfaith Network, an organization of 45 congregations, nonprofits, and unions. I'm here to thank the DC Council for ensuring that the property on North Capitol Street Northeast between L and K will be turned into 124 efficiency apartment units for homeless veterans and single adults. The project was born when Washington Interfaith Network leaders challenged the district government to dedicate a plot of land downtown for the purpose of housing our brothers and sisters who live on the streets or in substandard shelter. The voice of the people began to move the plan forward with the district's blessing. Since the beginning, the project has received great support on all fronts. The hope of creating this project of supportive housing will in the near future come to complete fruition and provide a home for 60 homeless veterans along with 64 additional affordable units. 
There are many reasons why it is important that supportive housing units exist in the downtown area of DC. Primarily, it allows tenants to be close to many amenities that may be taken for granted, but are essential to improve their current living situations and to maintain a fulfilled way of living. These include transportation for employment or school, ease of access to their respective faith institutions, and being able to reach any additional resources and social networks that may help them as they strive for success. All of these avenues are useful to anyone, but especially so to someone who may be experiencing hardship, allowing them to, in the end, come out on the other side accomplished. The endeavor to move forward with building these supportive housing units is very important to me and other leaders of WIN. Through my faith, I was always aware of my brothers and sisters in need and how it is our social and moral responsibility to do what we can to help them, our neighbors. Until I began working at St. Matthew's, I did not realize how deep-seated the issue of homelessness truly is. One of the ways I see this is through our parish's weekly breakfast ministry that serves around 60 homeless men and women every Monday. Our guests are people with talents and spiritual and philosophical insights that often leave me in awe. These are men and women that have goals and dreams and that above all have a resilient faith in God and that things will improve for them. As a child of God created with love and with purpose, they should not have to live in such a state that attempts to degrade their human dignity or limits them of their potential. When I was four years old, my family experienced homelessness as well. Fast forward 20 years later, in addition to being thankful for having a strong and devoted mother and others who formed our support system, I can truly say that an, an immense blessing what an, an immense blessing it was to receive the additional help we needed to follow our hopes and dreams. On behalf of Wynn, we thank you for providing the same blessing and opportunity to the 124 homeless individuals, um, sorry, for the, <clears throat> the 60 homeless individuals at the North Capitol Street site. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Nadine Molly. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee today. I'm here on behalf of Community Solutions, where I am the director of Inspiring Places, our national real estate initiative. I am Community Solutions' lead person working on the proposed North Capitol Commons project, working directly with Chapman Todd, our DC-based project manager. This project is planned for district-owned land, which is the subject of proposed resolutions 20-742 and 20-743. I am joined here today by some representatives of our development partner, McCormick Baron Salazar, and our philanthropic partners. Community Solutions is a nonprofit organization that works with communities to help solve the complex problems that affect their most vulnerable, hardest hit residents. We draw on successful problem solving tools and strategies from diverse sectors like public health, manufacturing, and design to help communities develop solutions to their most urgent problems. We began this work in New York City in Times Square in the early 1990s as Common Ground Community. At Common Ground, we developed near, nearly 3,000 units of permanent supportive housing, of which I was personally involved with building 1,000 of those apartments. Three years ago, we formalized our national work and created community solutions, and have continued to work with partners to develop mixed income, affordable housing, with an emphasis on including a significant number of permanent supportive housing units for those transitioning from homelessness. What we have found and third-party studies have shown, the permanent supportive housing not only directly benefited the residents and cost significantly less than tr transitional housing in the form of shelters or hospitals, but it has also increased surrounding property values and has been the catalyst for positive change in neighborhoods. Our work in the District of Columbia started almost five years ago when Community Solutions launched our 100,000 Homes campaign. And with the help of our District of Columbia-based staff, the city became one of the leading innovators in developing, developing and implementing a vulnerability survey, which resulted in systemic changes that help house homeless people faster and permanently. Partnering with the Rapid Results Institute, we introduced a process of guiding system improvements in 100-day cycles, an approach now used not only in the district but across the country to bring about significant reductions in the number of homeless veterans. The building we planned for North Capitol Commons with 60 
permanent supportive housing units targeted to formerly homeless veterans will play a prominent role in meeting both the federal and district commitments to end chronic veteran homelessness by the end of 2015. Community Solutions takes pride in creating beautifully designed and impeccably managed buildings where people are proud to come home and have access to the support and opportunities needed to rebuild their lives. Our development team has worked diligently to create a well-designed property that will be an attractive place for 124 people to call home and be a quality neighbor and asset to the community. Thank you for the opportunity to present these comments. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chapman, or uh, Mr. Todd, okay. I, I, it's an easy to turn around name and I answer to both. So. I have a <laughs> member of my staff is in the same situation. He's called Brandon Todd. Oh, Brandon yeah. Todd, right. Todd, so, Todd. Just, Todd, just Todd, like you. Right. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to, to testify today. My name is Chapman Todd uh, and I'm working with Community Solutions on the uh, proposed North Capital Commons project along with the other development partners on the team. I've lived in the district for almost 30 years and I've spent my professional career working with social service nonprofits that are focused on innovative and collaborative ways to improve the quality of life for individuals and families. Yesterday, Nadine and I were fortunate to be invited to uh, join a number of our partners and colleagues along with federal and government representatives from across the country at the White House where First Lady Michelle Obama spoke about the effort to end homelessness amongst veterans. First Lady spoke about the successes that have been made over the last several years, but also about the challenges that exist to meeting the target of ensuring that there are no homeless veterans by the target date of the end of 2015. Here in the district, great strides have been made and the number of homeless veterans is going down. The efforts around veteran homelessness in the district have shown that by working to coordinate systems, align program and funding priorities, and create new collaborative relationships, positive results can be achieved. There is a new emphasis on results-oriented systems change, and there is a true belief that we can use the efforts currently in place to not only end homelessness amongst veterans, but to use some of the same methods and models from this effort to eventually end chronic and long-term homelessness for all individuals and families. The proposed North Capital Commons project is, re is the result of a true collaborative effort to create affordable and service-enriched supportive housing in the district. The effort on this project has brought together a number of parties, including district government leaders, the federal government, and the philanthropic community, all of whom have come together to make an impact on the need for affordable housing opportunities in the district, as well as to meet the goal of ending veteran homelessness. We have taken the proposal for the North Capital Commons project through multiple public processes and are grateful for the support that we've gotten from the community to date, including from uh, ANC 6C, from the NOMA bid, from the Board of Zoning Adjustment, um, and others. And uh, he was not able to attend, but I um, did pass on the letter from the single member district representative from ANC 6C, Tony Goodman, which I hope will be part of the record that, uh, that represented the support of the ANC for this project in the times that we've been before them. Um, if approved, we will look forward to working with you to ensure that the North Capital Commons building is a great, affordable, and supportive housing development that everyone in this city can be proud of. Thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you, and I want to thank you all for your testimony, and I couldn't uh, more strongly support having uh, a plan to serve our veterans, um, and especially our ver veterans who are um, seeking housing and safe housing and affordable housing in the District of Columbia. Um, I know all of the testimony you provided about the, the task that remains, um, because it is a big one um, in, in serving veterans, um, and most especially serving, um, not only providing the housing needs, but providing the services needs um, that people will have who are, are uh, exiting homelessness. Um, so let me uh, kind of go to some of the, the economic <coughs> development questions and disposition questions, and uh, Mr. Todd, you may want to respond to these. I understand that this, um, this process has been going on since 2008. Is that true? Um, we may have started talking about uh, the creation of permanent supportive housing in the downtown area in 2008 on this specific project on this site. Um, I think the site was identified through DEMPED later than that. But there was a conversation at the beginning in 2008 about, um, about the creation of permanent supportive housing, particularly around veterans in the district. Okay. Um, I, I understood that, that, and I'm not sure if it was your group or who proposed uh, to the government to uh, take over this site. Was, it, the project originally started with Catholic Charities and Common Ground. Um, which is the, the 
predecessor to Community Solutions on that site. So we did, we did begin talking in two, uh, 2008. Um, Seems right on the specifics of the site. I would defer to the the Demped representative. So, um, you do you represent North Capital Commons? So I'm where I work with Community Solutions, the the Common Ground Communities. Okay, where is North Capital Commons? North do they Capital represent it here. The North Capital Commons Limited Partnership is the development team of Community Solutions, which is the the nonprofit entity, uh, the the majority partner in the limited partnership, and McCormick Baron Salazar is the other development partner. With what the is team. your share? Of you you said you're the majority partner. Is fifty one percent? Okay. But you're not on uh, the partnership did not actually so, um, submit the initial proposal. Is that right? Right. The, the, the tax credit structure, because this is a low-income housing tax credit finance deal, um, cannot, can't be a nonprofit that is the limited partnership. It needs to be a, 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 an LP. So the partner, the nonprofit partner, is the majority entity of the limited partnership. But because of the financing of the deal, uh, the limited partnership will be the leaseholder um, and the owner of the building that's on the district land. And so when did uh, McCormick, Barron, and Salazar become involved in this partnership? It was, it was last year. Early, last early 2013. Okay, so you say Catholic Charities, and I ask these questions because this, um, this property wasn't um, negotiated in the normal course um, because it was an unsolicited um, proposal and as I understand it there were no other offers made on the property and so uh, who was the entity that DEMPED selected to negotiate with exclusively? At the, the, the outset it was Catholic, Catholic Charities. Okay and then please explain to me how, it, how you became to be involved. Sure. So, um, and I was working at Catholic Charities at the time, so I've been involved with that since the beginning of the conversation. There were conversations with the district government around the creation of permanent supportive housing opportunities, particularly for veterans. And uh, there were two projects, um, concepts that the, the district government pursued, one of which is the La Casa project on Irving Street in Ward 1, and the other one, which is this North Capital Commons project on North Capital Street. Uh, so the, the district began working with Catholic Charities, which began working with Common Ground on the project. Catholic Charities went to Common Ground, given the group's uh, national experience um, in building permanent supportive housing in a mixed co income affordable model. As the, uh, uh, as the deal progressed and came together, there was a leadership change at Catholic Charities. Catholic Charities uh, determined that it was not going to be developing permanent supportive housing or affordable housing in the district area um, in, in, any, in, in, in any near term, given the parts of the deal that had already been put together. Uh, at that point, Common Ground, uh, Common Ground Doing Business as Community Solutions, the nonprofit entity, uh, then took over leadership on the project and continued to work with the district government on it. So, so Catholic Charities is still a supporter of this project, uh, it, but at that point, um, after 2008, uh, at some, I, I, I'm not sure of the year on that, but when Catholic Charities decided that it was no longer going to be the lead on the development of permanent supportive housing, Catholic Charities said to the district and to Common Ground um, that there, there's a momentum on this project. There is philanthropic support lined up. There is government support lined up. We don't want to see this not move forward. So at that point, uh, Community Solutions stepped in as the nonprofit partner on it. The, um, the mix of units, and anyone feel free to, to jump in here. The mix of units, so there are 147 units, is that right? 124 units. Um, Seventeen out of the one twenty four is thirty percent. Forty seven out of the one twenty four is at sixty percent. And the remaining uh, 60 units are permanent supportive housing. 
And describe for me the involvement of DMH in this deal. Sure. And I'll answer that because the numbers may be a little confusing on that. So just to clarify, of the 124 units, 60 of them are the permanent supportive housing targeted to veterans. The other 64 are affordable, and because of the nature of the tax credit structure of the project, they are all affordable to people at 60 percent of the area median income or below. Of that 64 units, we have an arrangement which is not fully consummated, which is why the numbers may sound different on this. But of those 64, we anticipate that 17 of those would be targeted to DBH-referred tenants. But that is not, it's not locked in at this point because of an arrangement between DHCD and DBH that needs to be finalized. So of that 64, 17 of the units we anticipate being for DBH, but we do not have an agreement in place right now for that. Might there be overlap between the veterans who are referred and the DBH clients who are referred? There very well could be. And how will the veterans be referred? We anticipate that the veterans will be referred off a list that the VA keeps. There's, and Kurt mentioned earlier, a coordinated entry effort that is very much underway and that Kurt and Miriam have been involved in that is working to streamline the system of identifying the highest priority persons for moving into permanent supportive housing. Kurt and others have been working with the district government and with the VA to bring those processes together. I believe it as it stands right now that the VA referrals come from the VA list and that city referrals would come from the district government agencies, but there is a thought that that will be more coordinated by the time that this project is ready for occupancy. So, Kurt, can you speak to me a little bit about the veterans would receive a voucher? Yes, they would receive some sort of subsidy to keep the unit affordable to them. So they would pay 30 percent of their income on rent. And that subsidy would be in the form of a voucher? Yes. Okay. And those are, is that part of the new vouchers that we have included in this budget, or is this an addition? I think it's a federal VASH. VASH is a specific type of voucher that is a partnership between the VA and HUD. And so what has been approved by the Housing Authority for use here is a, for the 60 permanent supportive housing units is a federal VASH voucher. Okay. And so finally, before I turn to Mr. McDuffie and then Council Member Wells, the Ward 6 Council Member, let me just ask this question. Is there another example where we have this mix of units and populations that we're trying to serve? Is there another example in the city that you're aware of? Well, so I'll jump in and say Councilman McDuffie mentioned one before that I had worked on, which is the summit at St. Martin's in Ward 5 in the Eckington neighborhood, which is a 178-unit project, 50 of which is for people exiting homelessness. That was a project that we did at Catholic Charities using expertise from, at that point, our friends and colleagues from Common Ground. And when that project was finished, the model is very similar here on North Capitol. The difference would be that the North Capitol project is efficiency units, but the mix, what we would call a mixed income affordable building, like St. Martin's with a significant portion of the units for people that are exiting homelessness, and then units for people up to 60 percent AMI. So the one that I personally have worked on is the St. Martin's project. There are others in town that are, I think, of a smaller scale, but I can't speak to this. And was DBH involved in that one, the St. Martin's? The housing authority? The behavior health. DBH was not formally involved in that one. They have some tenants that are in the building, but DBH. They didn't support any financing. They did not bring financing. Got it. It was a tax credit project, which Enterprise had been involved in, and it's probably, I would say, one of our stellar projects in the city on a number of levels. And I would encourage anyone to go and visit. It's a beautiful project. 
Very good. Uh, St. Martin's is on North Capitol, next to the church. It's this is part of the church project. The St. Martin's, the project, the, the one I was just referring to, mm -hmm. it, is, it is on T Street Northeast. Okay. It's directly I'm, across from McKinley Town. No, I'm very familiar with that one. We, we spent a lot of time talking about it down here at the council, I think, at the time. Uh, Mr. McDuffie. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Bowser. I actually don't have a, a, a lot of questions. You answered uh, many of the questions that I plan to ask. I do want to... As, well, first of all, thank all the witnesses uh, for their testimony and all the work that they're doing in this area. Obviously, affordable housing is really critical uh, priority for residents across the District of Columbia, as well as a number of my colleagues here on the council. I do want to ask you, Mr. Todd, if you could give me uh, some details around how the project team plans to include district residents and businesses uh, on the construction of the project. Um, I'm sorry, I thought regarding the, the construction of the project. Sure. Is so, there any plans to work with any? Uh, district-based businesses or residents in the construction? The, the general contractor um, and the architect on the project are both CBE entities. Uh, GCS Siegel is the general contractor and SORG is the architect. We have a CBE agreement in place that uh, re requires 40 percent of the construction costs to be CBE entities and uh, our general contractor is aggressively pursuing uh, being beyond that number. Um, so we are in the uh, <laughs> spot right now. We are very close to final pricing and bids in from the subcontractors, and that is something that uh, that GCS Siegel is tracking literally line by line. Okay, and you all don't anticipate any challenges with trying to meet those goals, the CBE goals? Um, we, we felt confident with GCS Siegel, given the work that they've done on, particularly with the school system on the schools, at being able to meet the, the CBE um, percentages. And as I said, the uh, expectation is that they will uh, meet or exceed those, and they're working very diligently to do that. Okay. Again, I want to thank each of you for your testimony. At this point, we can turn to Mr. Wells, Council Member for Ward 6. Thank you very much, and that's always good to see my board member from, from the Education Board and Monica Warren Jones, very good to see you and for all that you do. And I know you're here wearing your other hat, but certainly no one can really just live off the school board member's salary, so of course you're <laughs> doing other things. But good to see you and I'm, this is an interesting project to be a part of. I'd like to hear a little bit more about the ground floor retail tenant and to what degree is there any community input around trying to select a ground floor for a retail tenant? And is it market rate that this is, um, you know, leased at? Or is it, um, is there some, you know, incentive from the government side? And, you know, what we don't want, not that I, you know, want to categorize anything, but you know, probably not another cell phone store. So could you say a little bit about about how that is being selected and, if, and is that at market rate? Um, so we have no intention of creating another cell phone store on the on the ground floor. Um, I'm probably going to hear from all the cell phone store owners right now, but go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, we are looking at uh, creating a, a space on the ground floor that that's for the entire neighborhood and that also will be a great asset for the people in the building um, and looking at different ways to engage the veteran community um, in that ground floor retail space. We do not have a retail tenant yet in place um, uh, and we'll be happy to include people in the process as necessary. So is what you're saying you're going to try to blend the mission of the building with with synergistic retail or or I mean how do you you one of the things we, yeah more. so one of so this is just an example of something that we've been talking about is having a cafe on the ground floor that could obviously serve the neighborhood uh, serve the people in the building and it might be a place where where veterans can come and convene informally so that's something that we're thinking about um, you know that's just one idea but Jeff, well I, I'll, I'll add so we've been in regular contact with the NOMA bid about this and over I think the two years that we've been really talking in detail about it 
Um, we've stayed in touch with them about what may fit by the time that this project is up and going. I mean, there's been conversations about kind of arts type uses, uh, that, that type of thing, or as Nadine referred to, a, a, a cafe. But um, we're, you know, we're very interested in working with the business community there, and the NOMA bid has been uh, supportive of what we're doing, and we, we, we are going to be turning to them and others that you might suggest as that space uh, becomes closer to being ready for occupancy about what might fit. To answer your other question, we have uh, built some income in the operating budget from that space, but well below market, uh, so that uh, we're not dependent on that being the highest income generating use for the space, but being one that fits with the tone of the, 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 the tone and nature of that particular strip um, as it'll be a year and a half from now when we're ready and making sure that it's something that, that folks want to see there. Okay. And anything you may have already spoken to this, but the um, the environmental considerations of the building, will this be a lead building? Oh, I'm sorry. I Will this be a lead building? A lead building? No, we um, use enterprise green community standards for the for the building. Right. So our, our standards are embedded in the DC Green Building Building Law, which basically states, I think, that any any um, residential building that uses more than 10 or 15 percent of public resources must adhere to the enterprise uh, green standard, which is a um, a lead like affordable uh, a standard for affordable housing. And I also just want to also uh, note, Councilmember Wells, I was actually involved in a project years ago when, in my, in a, when I was wearing my housing hat uh, when I was working at Fannie Mae, where um, there was a project in New York called the Prince George's Hotel, which is a hotel um, that was rehabilitated for people at risk of homelessness. Common Ground was the services provider, and as part of their sort of economic development holistic approach, they partnered with Ben and Jerry's to provide um, lease space for a sort of satellite ice cream shop that also provided workforce development and economic development opportunities for the tenancy. So, um, you know, I, I've known the group for a while. I haven't worked with them um, recently, but I know that their model um, of what they do uh, on site is, is fairly, um, fairly progressive and, and, and also allows for the community at large to benefit. Yes, I can actually yes. show some of our tenants are the Ben and Jerry's. Uh, we have a large ballroom space at the Prince George um, that's open for all sorts of receptions and weddings. At another building, we have the Brooklyn Ballet on the ground floor. Um, projects that we're doing in New Orleans has like a ground floor cafe slash gallery. Um, so they're usually amenities that are great for the people in the building as well as the community. Okay, thank you very much. I have no further questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I want to thank all of the witnesses, and I look forward to making my recommendation to the committee um, to uh, proceed with this disposition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear about the, um, oh, Corey Lee. Is Corey Lee here? Do we have the government's testimony? Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Lee. Good morning. Good morning. Great. Okay. Good morning, Chairwoman Bowser, Chairman McDuffie, members and staff of the Committee on Economic Development and the Committee on Government Operations. For the name, for the record, my name is Corey Lee, and I serve in the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. I'm here to testify on behalf of the administration in support of 1005 North Capitol Street Northeast Surplus Declaration and Approval Resolution of 2014 and 1005 North Capitol Street Northeast Disposition Approval Resolution of 2014, the approval of which would authorize the mayor to declare surplus and dispose of district-owned property located at 1005 North Capitol Street Northeast. First, I'd like to thank all of the public witnesses for their testimony. I would also like to recognize the invaluable contributions of the community, particularly ANC6C, as well as our dedicated development team led by Common Ground Communities and McCormick Barron, advised by Chapman Todd of JDOT LLC. Without them, this project would not be possible. 
The development team has received zoning approval for the almost 9,000 square foot site and will construct a mixed use building containing approximately 124 units of affordable and permanent supportive housing for households earning at or below 60% of area median income and veterans, approximately 3,000 square feet of retail space, and 5,000 square feet of office. This development program represents the tireless work of the development team, uh, the community, and the district to ensure the project meets the community's vision and expectations for the site. This imp important project will serve a vital role in our city by not only placing into use a vacant parcel in a blossoming neighborhood, but also by furthering several important citywide goals related to affordable housing, veterans care, homelessness, and behavioral health services. Our affordable housing stock will grow by an additional 124 units, and veterans and others exiting homelessness will have access to permanent housing while they obtain services in support of their efforts to reestablish themselves in our community. In 2012, the district and developer began exclusively negotiating the disposition and development agreement for the property based on the developer's proven ability to deliver a project that would advance the district's long-term public policy goal of ending homelessness through the creation of site-based permanent supportive housing. The terms of the disposition and development agreement call for the new construction of an environment, environmentally sustainable apartment building with on-site social service space and ground floor retail. The project will be a model in the district and around the country of high quality housing accommodating veterans, household with a mix of incomes, and tenants who can permanently overcome conditions that resulted in their becoming homeless through the provision of a safe, secure, and dignified place to call home. As previously mentioned, this project will provide an important benefit beyond the typical amenities one expects from new housing namely ongoing behavioral health and other support services for its residents. It's also important to note that this feature will benefit all district residents, even indirectly, as it seeks to lower the incidence and impact of homelessness throughout the district, thereby strengthening the entire city. Finally, over the past several years, numerous meetings have been scheduled to solicit community input and comments. Almost all of those meetings were coordinated through the affected ANC or other neighborhood groups and stakeholders, ANC6C submitted to the Board of Zoning Adjustment on separate occasions, two letters in support of the project in St. Phyllis Baptist Church, which is located to the immediate south of the site, executed a memorandum of understanding with the development team and also offers its support. The project enjoys significant community support. Council approval of the resolutions before you today will result in tremendous benefits accruing to veterans, lower income households, and many others across the district. Moreover, the neighborhood will enjoy a more stable residential environment and continued growth along this important and transitioning corridor. This concludes my testimony. I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Lee. I appreciate it. My, my first question is I think your testimony spoke mostly, if not exclusively, to the, the disposition of the property. Are you representing the, the administration on the surplus as well, or do we expect? Correct. That? So you yes. are. Okay. Surplus and disposition. Okay. Uh, maybe you can share with us uh, when did the the property at 1005 North Capitol Street, uh, when did we first acquire that parcel? The district ownership dates back to the early 2000s. The early 2000s? Okay. And you said there were public meetings that were had on the surplus and disposition of yes, the property? Yes. The, the sur actual surplus meeting itself, the official surplus meeting, took place in December of 2012. December of 2012? Yes. And what kind of response did you all get from the community, the community and residents there? We did not have a large turnout. We, and I think part of the reason for that is the project had already received significant community support. I don't know what's going um, on with your mic. I have no idea. I wish I did. Um, it's community support in, uh, in front of the Board of Zoning Adjustment. So the Board of Zoning Adjustment approved a couple months prior to the surplus, uh, surplus meeting the project itself. And so we had received letters of support from the ANC. The developer had been in communication with you might, yeah, won't you? Yeah. yeah. Maybe just slide over to the next seat, perhaps. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So there have been significant community support. I don't know. Is this on? Significant community support. And, and you said that the ANC, uh, the, the ANC for that area, did provide a letter in support of the surplus and disposition? Correct, on two separate occasions. And in fact, I think it may have been submitted in the record today, an additional letter of support uh, dated as of June 4th, 2014. So there have been ongoing discussions with the community to keep them apprised of the progress of the project and that support continues today as you 
um, we're able to hear from St. Philip's Baptist Church and, and others within the community. Are you aware of any concerns that anyone has raised, whether through the ANC or any residents or community Not civic associations? Concerns. None yeah. whatsoever? None. Okay. None whatsoever. So all, those, all the, the feedback that the Deputy Mayor's Office and, and the administration has gotten on this parcel has been positive to your knowledge? Yes. Okay. I don't know that I, I have any concerns beyond what I've already asked, uh, uh, specifically as it relates to the surplus. I mean, the, the parcel is, is vacant right now, so there's nothing going on there. That's right. right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank Miles. you. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Lee, would you talk about um, how you say the district has owned the land since the early 2000s? Do you know why we came to acquire it? I don't know the specific um, circumstances under which we acquired the property. Okay, and it's a vacant parcel now. It is vacant. Uh, what is uh, the appraised value? It was appraised at approximately four million dollars by the Walker Group. Uh, okay, how old the is the appraisal? Year. It's been within the past year. Okay, um, can you also then um, talk about the terms of the lease? Sure, the lease accounts for the cost of affordable housing and permanent supportive housing the ongoing expense associated with operating and providing services on the site, um, as well as the cost of going through the approval process for BZA, which we've already done. And so the actual payment, monetary payment, is a dollar for the ground lease. And what that does is allow the district to retain fee simple ownership of the parcel so that 99 years from now, depending on where we are as a, as a city, we can uh, either look at amending what has occurred on the site and it also gives us control to the extent there's ever an issue as opposed to having to go through a process where we've given over fee simple ownership of the property we can simply terminate the ground lease so and what is the district's obligation to the operation of the building the only district obligation is LRSP uh, local rent supplement funds that are being provided by the housing authority so LSRP project-based, or are, or are you counting on vouchers? That's the development team for this. You may sit. You may sit. And just as, as Mr. Todd was, was stating, the LRSP, it's important to note, are just for the 17 units that will be associated with the DBH referrals. The, the Housing Authority has, a, has approved the use of 17 on those, but as I referenced earlier, because we don't have an agreement in place for, the, for DBH Capital to come in at this point, so we, we anticipate those 17 being for the DBH units. We fully expect that to happen, but the project, if, if that doesn't happen, uh, it would it would move it would move forward with okay. the 64 units, but that would be the only the district rent subsidy. The 60 PSH units are the federal VASH that we okay. talked about 60 earlier. Okay, 60 are federal VASH, and then you're expecting 17 units to be subsidized by the housing authority. Right, and the housing authority board has already approved that. Okay, but what we don't have in place is the the. Uh, capital support from the DB, from DBH that would have the covenant that would tie those to DBH referred tenants. So that would be the 17 units. We expect that to happen, but because the document hasn't been generated through DBH and DHCD, that's why we, as we've described the units. Um, okay. It would be helpful for us to have that when we go to markup. Is that something that's imminent? Yes. Okay. So that would be helpful. Um, and the total construction cost, tell me again. The, the hard cost is, that's the total, total development cost is about $31 million. $31 now. million. No, the hard cost construction is, I think, 21. Twenty one. And you, and that's financed? Yes. And ready so to go? We okay. have the, the home money through DHCD. Um, we have the contract in um, place with DGS, and then we have the tax credit financing, and we have $4 million of philanthropic support on okay. the project. And when would you be able to start? The building permits are imminent. Um, we have a number of uh, legislative pieces, including this, that would have to, to occur before we could start. But we expect the building permits uh, to be issued any time and that we are aiming for a closing in 
mid mid late July. Okay, that sounds good. Those are my questions. Thank you All both. Right, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to turn to consideration of PR twenty seven six three and PR dash twenty seven six four, the Young School Surplus Declaration and Disposition Approval Resolutions of twenty fourteen. Um, the Young School uh, was introduced. These disposition, these excuse me, resolutions were introduced by Chairman Mendelson at the request of the Mayor and referred um, to each of our committees. Um, the property, as Mr. McDuffie stated earlier, is the former Charles E. Young School um, that's in the Trinidad neighborhood of Ward 5. And it has, uh, the, you, this property has um, been the subject of at least three um, schools, uh, uh, art solicitations from the government. And uh, in 2013, the Two Rivers Public Charter School was chosen uh, because it demonstrated academic success and um, demonstrated a high demand for, for space. Two Rivers uh, has been um, described as a tier one school um, by the Public Charter School Board and is known for its academic program that features expeditionary learning. The school has been successful, um, receiving over 1,800 applications last year for uh, 35 open spots. So uh, with that, I will um, turn to Mr. McDuffie um, for any comments. I will say that uh, the terms before us are, appear to be in line with other charter school dispositions, 25-year lease with a 25-year renewal. Uh, the Two Rivers School will pay market rent for the property with an initial, with an, an initial annual base rent of $471,000 uh, per year with a 2% annual increase. Two Rivers will pay to demolish two obsolete wings of the Young School um, and redevelop the property um, at the expense of the school. The current estimate for restoration is $13 million, including hard and soft construction costs. The school will receive a dollar for dollar rent credit in the amount of $13 million for the capital improvements it will make to the property. In other words, um, it, the rent will be abated in the amount of the capital investment the school will make. Um, once complete, um, this school would serve 370 students. Mr. McDuffie. Anything? Yeah, open. Or in, at the same, whatever. All right. yeah, I, I had an opening, but I'm a, actually um, not going to go into it. You covered all the particulars with your statement, uh, Ms. Bowser. So I, I want to just sort of ask a couple of questions, uh, if I could, of Ms. Wodach. Uh, I do appreciate you all being here. I, I had an opportunity to visit with you uh, and a number of the uh, administrators, as well as some of the students at Two Rivers uh, last year and had a really great tour of the facilities um, that are in Ward 6, just below Florida Avenue. And I guess my, my questions relate to, uh, specifically to the ward uh, that I represent, which is Ward 5, which is where Young uh, is located. It's a school that was closed in 2008, and there are a lot of uh, residents in Ward 5 who might have an interest in attending the school. I, I mentioned the percentage in my opening, but if you could talk a little bit about uh, the percentage of students that you have who, who are from Ward 5 and, and how you all go about uh, selecting uh, the students who make up your student body. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. I'm Jessica Wodach. I'm the executive director and one of the founders of Two Rivers, also a native Washingtonian. Um, so the Two Rivers, like all, uh, participates in the citywide lottery. Uh, this was the first year that we did that, the first year the city had that lottery. Um, most schools in the city did participate. And so all folks who are interested in applying to Two Rivers went through the citywide lottery um, and were uh, selected at random, given the several preferences that are permitted by law. Um, and so that is how our, our school is filled. Um, it's the same algorithm that's used for anyone who's participating in the citywide lottery. Um, when, when we add the young campus, we would, as many schools who have multiple campuses do, both campuses would also go through the citywide lottery and um, families would rank the schools that they are interested in and they would rank either campus according to their interest level in that campus. Does and that it, answer your question or did it, you have It does. Something? As a matter of fact, perhaps, um, uh, Chairman Biles, I should, in all fairness, give you an opportunity to, to read your statement that you have and then I'll, I'll save some questions until you've had an opportunity to, uh, to make your 
the statement, if that's okay. Absolutely. You may, you may proceed. Okay. You did cover a lot of it already, but uh, <laughs> thank you for having me, Chairperson Bowser and Chairperson McDuffie. Um, as I said, I'm Jessica Wodach, the Executive Director and one of the founders of Two Rivers. Thanks for offering me the opportunity to testify. I'm here on behalf of Two Rivers in support of the proposed resolutions 20-763 and 20-764 regarding the Council's surplus disposition of the Young School, located at 820 26th Street Northeast, and also the Council's approval of a lease pursuant to which Two Rivers will lease the Young School from the District of Columbia. Two Rivers is a preschool through eighth grade charter school here in DC with over 500 students. We are, as you mentioned, a tier one school as classified by the Public Charter School Board and have been such for the past three years. The school's in great demand with a waiting list of over 1,700 students. Um, more than 3,000 families marked us as one of their choices uh, this year in the Common Lottery. Uh, sorry, not 3,000 families, 3,000 students, the families of 3,000 students. We hope to replicate our very successful elementary school program by ground leasing the Young School Building located at 820 26th Street Northeast. Two Rivers benefits local students in the community by, among other things, being one of the hot, top performing schools in the city. Our mission is to nurture a diverse group of students to become lifelong active participants in their own education, develop a sense of self and community, and become responsible and compassionate members of society. Our demanding academic program is augmented by an integrated arts program and a content-based content Spanish program. These elements come together through learning expeditions that allow students to incorporate and apply their classroom learning through real-world experiences. We also embrace students with disabilities and provide the necessary supports to ensure their success as learners and community members. More than 20% of our student body is students with special needs. The district has not used the Young School since 2008 as a District of Columbia Public School. The Department of General Services has determined that the Young School is surplus to the district's needs. If the surplus disposition of the Young School is approved by the Council and the lease for Young is fully executed, Two Rivers will fully renovate the Young School. We anticipate spending approximately $13 million in connection with the renovation of the Young School. By the fall of 2015, we plan to educate approximately 180 students, starting with pre-K-3 and going through first grade at the Young School. The lease will have an initial term of 25 years, with a rental rate of $471,250 per year, with annual increases of 2%. Two Rivers will receive a dollar-for-dollar dollar credit in connection with the renovations that we make to the Young School. We intend to finance the Young School renovation through proceeds of tax-exempt revenue bonds issued by the District of Columbia on our behalf. The Council voted on and passed the bond application this week. Thank you. Um, Two Rivers takes seriously its commitment to being a good corporate citizen and a member of the local community. More than 60% of our employees are district residents. All of our students live in the district and roughly two-thirds of those students are minorities. In connection with the financing, we're signing both the Certified Business Enterprise Utilization Agreement and a First Source Employment Agreement relating to our contracting and hiring opportunities in connection with the project. Thank you very much. I speak for everyone at Two Rivers when I say how much I appreciate your time and consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. And thanks for your testimony. Mr. McDuffie, do you want to go back to your questions? Yeah, thank you, um, Councilman Bowser. Uh, you answered some of the questions in your testimony, Ms. Wardash, but I want to um, just follow up on a few things. I don't know, have you all identified uh, who's going to be doing the construction? We have. Uh, we've done the RFP process and we've selected MCN Build as our construction team. MCN Build, okay. The MCN has done quite a number of school projects here in D.C., um, most recently Capital City, KIPP. Um, they've also done Washington Latin. KIPP is in War 5 on uh, Mount Olivet and they're working on that as well. That's right. It will actually be the same team leaders moving uh, when they're done there to, to our building. Okay. And since more than 60% of our employees are district residents, mm -hmm. um, how do you, how do you, are you all sensitive to the wards where you, where you, where you locate your schools? Obviously, kids are selected from across the city, uh, which is very important so that everybody has an opportunity to attend. Uh, but I know in some cases, their sensitivities to families and parents and students who live in the communities where the schools are located. Uh, are you all sensitive to those types of concerns and, and how do you respond to um, concerns that parents might raise about that? Uh, do you mean in selecting our students? Yes. So um, 
The community has expressed an interest in having neighborhood preference for the school, um, and we certainly understand where they're coming from. It is an amenity in their community. That's currently not allowed um, under the law. It is something that Two Rivers would support for the young campus if it was made available as an opportunity to do legally, to have a neighborhood preference that would be included along with sibling preference. Um, so it's not something that can currently be done by any charter school, but we would certainly be interested in considering it if, if it became available. And, and you're going to be opening up with, with grades uh, in the fall? So we'll, the plan is to open pre-K three through first grade and then grow a grade a year, which is how we launched our initial elementary school and is recognized as a great way to build culture and create a strong school. Ultimately going up to what grade though? So the building that we're planning to construct will initially serve our kids through elementary school, but all of the kids at that campus will be served through middle school. And so we're uh, waiting to see if we, how we would serve them and if it would be in that location. Okay. And I know that the building is, in, is currently is in extreme disrepair, but do you all, when do you all anticipate um, opening your doors for your students? I'm sorry, when do we, we expect to open? opening the doors for students? So um, we're hoping that the process will move quickly, and if we are able to get a lease before the council recesses, which we're hoping to be able to do since a lot of other things, the financing and the construction rest on that, we would break ground this fall with the anticipation to open in fall of 2015. Okay, and can you describe uh, some of your public outreach efforts that you all have made to the community? Sure. Um, so one of the things that's been really exciting to go into a new community and to get to know that community, I myself am a, a ward Six resident raised in Ward Six and, and currently a Ward Six resident, um, so we have uh, we have selected the principal of the young campus, uh, Mr. Guy Turner, and he's been a staff member at Two Rivers for many years. Was one of our original staff members. Um, so Guy Turner and I have been attending the ANC meetings. We've hosted um, several of the ANC commissioners at Two Rivers. They've toured the buildings. We held a coffee recently and invited members of the community to attend Two Rivers, um, and have tried to make ourselves available and help them get to know Two Rivers as, as much as possible. Are you aware of uh, any concerns that, that any of the ANC commissions have raised to you all? The, I feel the ANC has been very clear on two things. They've asked us to please maintain the name of the school, and we think that the um, certainly Charles Young is a very inspirational figure, and so we want to include that along with the name of Two Rivers, so we, will, we are planning to um, absolutely respect that request. Their other request has been uh, for neighborhood preference, and we've been very clear all along that we would support that if possible, but that we can't make promises um, currently that we can't keep. So the, those have been the, the two things that we've heard loud and clear over the past year, I would say, from the ANC. Have they taken any steps to, to indicate their support one way or another? Of, of Absolutely. They, they have spoken in favor of Two Rivers. Um, the, when DGS held the hearing uh, for anybody who was interested in applying for DGS, um, the ANC commissioner did speak in favor of Two Rivers. Is that the ANC commissioner who represents the single member district or the chair of the ANC? That was uh, Ms. Kathy Henderson, so that was the chair of that ANC. It wasn't the single member uh, commissioner at that particular meeting, but both have been supportive of Two Rivers and both have visited us. Okay. Uh, I don't have any additional questions. Thank you, Ms. Wodach. Thank you, Ms. Wodach, and I, I appreciate um, your testimony. It also sounds like um, your support. Now, we recognize that the law um, prescribed pr prescribes how um, people may access or be assigned to public charter schools. Um, and we also recognize that we could change the law. Um, so my, uh, my question to you is if that, if that law were on the table, would you be supportive of uh, the neighborhood preference at, on both campuses? Um, I appreciate that, that question and that distinction. Um, I thought that the, the team that researched that did good work, and one of the things that was very compelling to us was to see how that how a neighborhood preference law could impact the students most in need of high quality seats. Um, and so I think where we stand is that we would support neighborhood preference for young, specifically because it, it was a community asset that is being um, turned into a charter school, and so we would want the community members in that community to have access. We would not want to change our current building um, to have neighborhood preference, and so we do support the um, the version of the law which gives uh, charter schools the opportunity to, in, to use neighborhood preference if they are converting a DCPS building. 
Okay, so you wouldn't support it at your other building because it's not a DCPS, it was not a DCPS building. That's right, and because we do serve a, a high percentage of kids um, who would potentially lose the opportunity to attend. Did you specifically want to be at Young, or you were in the market for any former school building? Um, I would not say we were in the market for any former school building. There were actually quite a few that were that we had the opportunity to apply for. There were a number of things that were really exciting to us about Young. Um, first of all, we're called Two Rivers, and Young is on the banks of one of those rivers, and so that is really exciting to be able to be located very close. Uh, we have had a partnership over the 10 years we've been in existence with the Anacostia Watershed Society, and so to be able to, to have proximity to that and to continue um, the work that we've done with our kids getting to know our local rivers and um, become stewards of our, our neighborhood. Um, so that was very exciting to us. Our current location on the corner of Fourth and Florida is a great location with zero green space. Um, Young has a lot of green space, and so that was certainly very attractive to us. Um, the proximity of the buildings is close enough that we can share resources with, another, with one another, but not so close that um, it, it will not draw different populations. And so we are happy about that. Once the streetcar is in effect, we'll be able to walk a few blocks and hop on the streetcar to get from one building to the other. Um, and finally, I think the community has been um, inspirational to us. It's, it's a unique community. It, there's a lot of senior um, support in, in Ward 5, and um, there's been definitely a sense of welcoming of any good opportunity for kids to have good schools. And so I think all of those factors went into us being interested in the young building. It's also a very nice building, though, as the council member uh, mentioned, and it's in very bad disrepair. Um, but we think that it would, um, with renovations, it, it cannot right now, but with renovations, can serve our, um, our program very well. Do you know the breakdown by ward of at your current school? Um, I could get you the exact numbers. Um, ward 6 definitely has the highest number of students. Ward 5 would be our second highest, and uh, Ward 7 and 8 after that. But I can get you the exact percentages. We also, as I mentioned, we had over 3,000 students uh, select us as one of their choices in the citywide lottery, and we can get breakdowns for those uh, by ward as well, if you would like. Did you consider a building east of the river in Ward 7 or 8? The only buildings that were available were quite enormous. And so one of the things that were really quite, quite large, quite okay. enormous. Um, so we did take a look at the buildings that were, be, that were available, um, but they were very large. That's the same reason that we did not pursue um, the building which was closer to us that is now going to be uh, with KIPP. Um, so the size of the building and our ability to leverage financing and, and renovate it in a, a cost-effective way was a factor in, in selecting the building. Okay, so your position on neighborhood preference not that, that this question is unrelated to the, the present matter, but since you're here and I'm here um, and I'm interested to know, um, would be that, and I guess you can only speak for your school, but in um, if there is a, a former uh, government school building that you would then support a neighborhood preference on the uh, that being a, the, a district-wide policy upon dis disposition of the building. I would support that as an option for a charter school to elect, yes. Got it. Okay. Um, those were my questions for you. Thank you very much, and congratulations on, on, what, uh, on the you. success of, of your school. Thanks so much, and we'd be happy to have you visit any time. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, Brian Hanlon. Mr. Kane, you're speaking for Mr. Hanlon? Okay. Thank you, um, and I would like to recognize uh, Brian Hamlin, who's going to, I'm sorry, Jonathan Kane, who will represent the government. And with me is Althea Holford Althea, with the Ms. Deputy Holford, Mayor for Education's you. Office. Would you like me to begin my testimony? Please. Okay. Good morning, Chairpersons McDuffie and Bowser, and members and staff of the Committees on Government Operations and Committee on Economic Development. I am Jonathan Kane, Associate Director for Portfolio at the Department of General Services. Today I am pleased to testify on PR 20-763, the Young School Surplus Declaration Resolution of 2014, and PR 20-764, the Young School Dispos uh, Disposition Approval Resolution of 2014. The Young School, located at 820 26th Street Northeast, has not been used by the District of Columbia Public Schools since 2008 due to low enrollment. That same year, 
Office of Property Management issued a competitive solicitation to identify a charter school, but the solicitation did not result in a selection. The school has been resolicited several times in March and October of 2012 and July 2013, with the July 2013 solicitation resulting in the selection of Two Rivers Charter School, Public Charter School. The Tier 1 Charter School has demonstrated academic success and there is a high demand for additional seats, both with Two Rivers in particular and the community generally. Per DC official code, 10801, DGS held a public meeting to solicit community input on the surplus designation of the Young School on July 10th, 2013. A second public hearing was held following the RFO to allow all the charter school applicants to present their offers before the community. Residents asked questions about the school leasing process and offered suggestions for reuse of the property, including a recreation center, library, or meeting space while some residents objected to have only charter schools for which to choose. Under the, Landrew Public charter, under the Landrew Act, public charter schools have a right of first offer on former school buildings for which the district no longer has an educational need or public purpose. The proposed disposition method is a ground lease of 25 years with 25 year option, which aligns with the requirements of the Landrew Act. The proposed lease will pay market rent as determined by an independent appraiser. The annual base rent is $471,250 per year with an annual increase of 2%. If the disposition is approved, the school plans to demolish two functionally obsolete wings. DGS proposes that the base rent be based on usable square footage following the de demolition. The ground leasing option not only complying with the Landrew Act provides economic benefits to the district as it will continue to own a newly renovated, potentially lead facilities without the capital expense, as well as being able to provide for additional educational seats in educational cluster 23, wards 5, 7, and 8 students. Two Rivers expects to renovate the property, which will incur, and it will incur that cost at its sole expense, while also adhering to relevant first source, green building, and CBE requirements. The renovation is estimated at $13 million, for which the proposed leasee will receive a dollar-for-dollar -dollar rent credit for the capital improvements to the property. The school plans to begin serving students from pre-K through first grade during the 2000 2015-2016 school year, which plans to add one grade level each year. At capacity, the school will serve 350 students. DGS believes that the proposed lease for the Young School will provide a highly qualified educational program to its students while providing much needed physical revitalization to an existing district asset. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Uh, Mr. Kane, to your knowledge, is there anything about this lease agreement that is out of um, the norm, your normal course, or Ms. Holford, in, in, in um, entering into leases with public charter schools? No, I think this lease is consistent with the other leases. Okay. Um, did you describe the green space and play space at the young school? Uh, the fields are not, if the question is, are, are the fields part of this, the fields uh, are not part of this uh, lease. Can you describe the fields? I'm looking at a... There's, there's a sort of a green space to the rear of the property. Uh, and it's, in my understanding, it's, it's really not well utilized, but there's a green space towards the real, uh, rear that uh, we're identifying as the field portion. And there is a playground? So I understand it? Uh, my understanding is yes. There's there, a playground. There's a playground there as well. It's a playground. Uh, are there, are they, is it program fields or is it just green space? Uh, the fields are, are not programmed. They're not uh, programmed, they're so they're space. not set up for any type of particular sport. Um, are there basketball courts? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, was there any agreement with the school to make sure that the green space and playground remains available to the public? 
uh, in the lease, uh, our plan is to have this consistent with other leases where there will be an agreement for uh, uh, use of hours for them to use this space uh, in conjunction with DPR. Okay. So you know this hasn't worked well um, with all of the leases that I've been involved in. There, there's some um, discussion back and forth between the school and the community when the school needs the playground or fields or when the school doesn't or when it's going to be posted or why is the playground locked, why is the, the field locked. So um, I want to make sure that it's expressly included in the lease agreement um, how the public will have access to the fields, um, uh, whether there will be fencing permitted, uh, doors locked, um, and particularly uh, the playground uh, area as well. And okay. the school expects to improve the playground, I'm assuming. And it, 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 um, it's they're not putting significant dollars into improving the green space. Um, and I, I should have asked Ms. Wodach, but we'll, we'll follow up with her to yes, get. That's, that's my understanding. That, and perhaps, Mr. McNuffy, you could give me a little bit more information about the condition um, of, of the play space. I'll turn to Mr. McDuffie now. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bowser. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Kane. Now, just a, a couple of questions. You answered a lot of my questions in your testimony. Um, are you aware of any support that's been provided uh, for the surplus and disposition of the young school uh, by the community? Uh, and or ANC 5E that represents that area where Young is located? Uh, at the hearing uh, which DGS held, the ANCs did support, um, they did indeed support Two Rivers Public Charter School. And was that? But we didn't receive a written, uh, written notice. They indicated their support uh, the orally during the meeting? Yeah, of the or, or through, with the school? Mm hmm Okay. Um, as you all know, the, the, the young school is located on the campus with Spingarn, uh, Brown, as well as Phelps. Um, and I know what the code provides for in terms of the surplus and disposition of schools, as you indicated in your testimony, Mr. Bless Kane. You. Bless you. Um, but I just want to ask the question, were, were there any concerns raised by DCPS given the proximity of Young to Brown, which is an education campus, which is sort of uh, going through some transition right now with trying to implement the IB program there. Are you aware of any concerns about DCPS, the surplus in the young? I'm going to look to Althea again. Uh, I, we did not receive any from DGS. Um, DCPS. And, DCPS, uh, excuse me. But because uh, Two Rivers is a uh, citywide lottery school, we believe that there would be enough space for both, both schools. Okay. And you, you talked a little bit about the lease of the green space with Councilmember Bowser, um, what, what specifically what green space are you referring to? There's uh, there's a green space at the rear of the property. Okay, so there also are football fields and playground and and uh, and other amenities across the across street. Across the street, yes. Um, are any of those included in the lease, or is the lease just the building and the immediate grounds of the of that? Young it's school. it's the building and the media grounds. Uh, there is uh, no mention, or will there be, of the fields across the street? Okay, uh, I just wanted to make sure because my concern right now, spring on is closed. It's anticipated to open at some point, and I wanted to make sure there wouldn't be any issues with the use of the high school students of the field and the other uh, facilities across the street. And so, you all don't anticipate there, any problem with that. It is it is not part of the lease. No. Okay. Um. I don't know that I have any additional questions uh, outside of the ones that I just asked and the ones you answered with Councilmember Bowser's uh, line of questioning at this point. You know, actually, I do. There in the um, – I was reading something. I think this is the surplus analysis. It says that – the records indicate that the building was renovated a really long time ago, but then it says it was also renovated in 1997 with cosmetic changes only. Was 1997 the last time the building was renovated? Uh, it was in 2008. I thought there were some renovations that were done in either 2007 or 8. I would need to check that. Okay. Um, 
I only ask because I, I toured the facility, and I know uh, that it's in extreme disrepair. I know there's been some some leaks and some flooding, and, as well as some vandalism and arson associated with the school. So it's going to take uh, a good amount. But I was just sort of curious as to whether or not that was accurate. That the last time it was renovated was 1997. I know we'll need to follow up. There could have been some maintenance items or things addressed that weren't necessarily capital. But what we can do is get back to you uh, uh, on Monday with an answer. Okay. All right. I don't have any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. And I just want to state for the record that um, your office provided, and I appreciate, and I know when we started doing this last year, the comparisons between all of the leases with the public charter schools um, in the district to make sure that they are consistent and have some rhyme and reason and that we were working with standard lease terms mm -hmm. um, across the board. And so as I uh, review uh, these lease terms, um, I would concur with, with you um, that they are consistent um, with what has um, um, been happening with our public charter schools and DCPS. Um, so uh, with that, I, I'm going to make the recommendation to the committee that we approve um, this disposition. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you Mr. for Mr. McDussie, do you have anything else for the record? So hearing uh, no further comment um, from the committee, it's 12.02 and we're adjourned. <laughs>